Hi everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is the Schwerer Gustav. Uh, it's obviously German, German pronunciation. There are going to be some of those. I'm going to screw them up. You're going to have a go at me in the comments. It is the circle of YouTube life, but I apologize ahead of time. I am doing my best. I speak English, not German. I try. So today we're talking about a gun, really, really big gun. I mean, this thing was actually bloody massive. In fact, it's the largest artillery gun ever made. Yesterday, I present to you Schwerer Gustav, weighing in at a whopping 1,350 tons with an overall length of 43.3 meters. That's 142 feet for my Imperial friends. This heavyweight artillery piece was absolutely no joke. And if you'll pardon the pun, it really packed a punch, but a boom, boom. Made by the Germans, hardly a surprise there. This weapon was a super railway gun built in the 1930s with the explicit purpose of reducing the French Maginot line to dust. Of course, things didn't pan out exactly like that. All the same, it's still a terrifying example of the height of the German military power during World War II. What exactly became of this bear moth of a machine and why did the Germans only ever build two? Well, we're definitely going to answer those questions in today's video, so let's jump in, shall we? The French Maginot Line was a line of concrete fortifications, obstacles, and weapons installations spanning a pretty mind-blowing 943 miles, and it was said to be impassable. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. I mean... <laughs> I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I'm right in thinking they went around it, right? I guess we're going to find out. The Maginot Line was invulnerable to aerial bombings and tank fire. It had underground railways as a backup. It also had state-of-the-art living conditions for garrison troops, supplying air conditioning and eating areas for their comfort. It was just widely accepted that the Maginot Line was not something that could be broken. The Germans decided, though, that they were going to test that theory, and they were going to do that by blowing a hole straight through the Maginot Line and just marching their armies to the other side. To accomplish this feat and break through the line, the Germans would need a machine capable of piercing through seven meters of reinforced concrete or one full meter of steel armor plating. Krupp engineer Erich Müller calculated that the task would require a weapon with a caliber of around 80 centimeters, firing a projectile weighing seven tons from a barrel 30 meters long. This weapon would have a weight of over a thousand tons. No machine this big had ever been built. The outlook of the Germans was simple. There's no problem too big. An even bigger gun cannot solve. Hitler demanded the creation of this machine eager to reduce the Maginot Line to dust and begin that onslaught. To show his contribution to the war effort, the arms manufacturer Gustav Krupp offered to build this gigantic weapon for free. What a good Nazi. And so, in 1934, Krupp began assembling the Super Gun. Krupp ended up running a bit late, however, and Schwerer Gustav didn't enter service until 1941. This meant the huge railway gun wasn't able to fulfill Hitler's plan and blast that Maginot line to smithereens. Talk about a bit of a missed deadline there. Time, it waits for no man or super artillery piece, apparently, and the war, it just went ahead without Germany's biggest gun. Stupid, impolite war. Instead of using the super railway gun, Germany came up with the innovative solution of just going around the Maginot Line. I thought so. On the 10th of May 1940, Germany began its invasion of neutral Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, but that's definitely a story for another day. Probably not something I'll cover on the Mega Projects channel, but, you know, I've got other channels for covering that sort of stuff. Schwerer Gustav was the largest caliber rifle weapon ever used in combat, and in terms of overall weight, the heaviest mobile artillery piece ever built. While the weapon was inarguably an engineering marvel, it was also pretty damn impractical. In order to move this huge machine, specially constructed tracks were created for it to run on. To transport the railway gun long distances, it first had to be disassembled and then reassembled using cranes. And not only that, but another set of tracks were required for the actual cranes to move on. So. You might say that this super gun wasn't acquiring a lot of traction. And that will be the last pun, but a boom boom. Tss. 
Jokes aside though, this huge artillery weapon was turning out to be a lot more work than it was worth for the Germans. 250 crewmen were required to assemble the gun, which took up to three and a half days to complete. A further 2,500 men were required to lay down the tracks. As well as that, in order to protect the weapon from air attacks, it had to be accompanied by a number of flak battalions at all times. The railway gun's massive size meant that it was really visible to planes and, you know, they would just bomb it. Another shortcoming of the railway. Can you imagine being one of those pilots being like, this looks like a really big gun. We should probably destroy that. Another shortcoming of the railway gun was its limited range of motion. The weapon's gigantic 32.5 meter or 106 foot barrel could only move up or down at an angle of about 48 degrees. What's more, to achieve horizontal targeting, the huge artillery gun could only be moved along the curved track. It couldn't do this on its own. All the extra steps, manpower, and resources needed to make this machine even operational, it really just begs the question, was this all worthwhile? I mean, yes, it looks epically badass and scary, and who, you know, in the modern day doesn't love scary Nazi war machines, but, you know, was it worth it? Like we said already, it could pack a punch. The weapon caliber alone on the barrel was 80 centimeters, 31 inches. Also, those concrete piercing shells, they weighed seven tons each, making them the largest and heaviest shells at that time by a vast margin. These shells could be fired for a range of over 47 kilometers, that's 29 miles. It's incredible. Just these absolutely vast 80 centimeter size bullets, essentially, just being fired 29 miles. That's like to the next town. It's across the English Channel. I think we're getting to that. However, after about 300 shells were fired, the enormous barrel would need to be replaced. While 300 shells sounds like a lot, at a rate of fire of around 14 rounds a day, the barrel would have to be replaced roughly every 22 days. This meant another shipment from Krupp's factory back in Germany to wherever the gun was positioned. This was just another example of the issues that the crew of this super gun faced. Due to Schwerer Gustav's late arrival to the war, it was sent to the Eastern Front and used at the Siege of Sevastopol as part of Operation Barbarossa. 4,000 men were needed to set up the artillery weapon in position. During the siege, the huge artillery gun fired 300 shells at the enemy lines, including Soviet fortresses and ammunition dumps, which were specifically targeted. Following this siege, the gun was transported to be used in the attack on Leningrad. However, this attack was ultimately cancelled. The gun was to remain mostly inactive for the remainder of the war. On the 14th of April 1945, one day before the arrival of US troops, the railway gun was destroyed by German troops in order to prevent its capture by the enemy. A week later, its ruins were discovered by the American troops. In the summer of 1945, the remains of Schwerer Gustav were studied by Soviet specialists, and in the autumn of that same year, the wreckage of the weapon was transported by the Soviets to Merzberg, where German military material was being gathered. That was the last anyone ever saw of this giant machine. To this day, the whereabouts of its remains are still unknown. Perhaps it was scrapped for metal, or maybe it's just sitting in the backyard of a very wealthy Russian man who really knows, and that's why no one messes with Putin, allegedly. All right, so that was the Schwera Gustav, but fear not. The Germans didn't stop at one deadly mega weapon. Hang around on this Mega Projects channel to hear about the second super railgun. Interesting, railgun, also another type of thing, but when we talk about it here, we're referring to a gun that is on rails. We're gonna hear about a lethal barrel attachment and a super tank that would have weighed 1,500 tons had it been completed. I love how the Nazis just made, <laughs> made things that are like straight out of fiction. Some men buy their significant others nice jewelry. Other men name super artillery after them. The chief engineer working for Krupp was one such man. The second huge male gun the Germans made was simply called Dora, named after the chief engineer's wife. <laughs> I can imagine if she had like a, a you know a more gentle name, like oh what's the gun called? Sally. <laughs> Dora was deployed briefly in the Battle of Stalingrad, however, her reign was short-lived. Dora was withdrawn when Soviet troops threatened to encircle the German forces. When the Germans retreated, they took Dora with them. Whether or not Dora actually existed is still a mystery to historians today. Some sources claim that the gun was just a nickname for Schwerer Gustav. However, other sources claim that there are financial records that prove Dora was built and sold by Krupp. 
The truth of the matter is less clear. No physical evidence of Dora has ever been found. Supposedly, in March 1945, Dora was transferred to Gravenvor, where a month later she was blown up by the Germans, likely to prevent capture as well. The debris of Dora was discovered by American troops sometime after the discovery of Schwerer Gustav's ruins. Dora's debris was scrapped in the 1950s, and, well, that, dear viewer, is the end of super railguns for Germany. I mean, maybe they'll bring them back, but today we have you know, missiles and drones and stuff. <laughs> In November 1943, plans were initiated to build a special barrel for Schwerer Gustav. This was a barrel that could have had a devastating effect on the war. That barrel was the Langer Gustav. This cannon had a caliber of 52 centimeters or 20.5 inches. The barrel was 43 meters or 141 feet in length. It was designed to fire projectiles at incredible ranges. It was said to be capable of reaching a range of 190 kilometers. I was, I had my mind blown earlier at 40. That's insane. Four times more. This gave the monstrous barrel the range to hit London if it was positioned in Calais, France. However, the barrel was never completed as it was damaged during construction by a Royal Air Force raid on Essen. Awesome. <laughs> Another project that never became operational was a machine that sounds like it came straight out of the Terminator, the Land Cruiser P-1500 Monster. In 1942, it was proposed to construct a machine similar to the Schwerer Gustav, only this time it would be mounted on a self-propelled platform that could move without the railway tracks. It was aptly nicknamed Monster. For all intents and purposes, this monster was just an absolutely vast tank. Like I said earlier, this would have weighed 1,500 tons had it been constructed, which would have been 150 times heavier than Schwerer Gustav itself. The barrel width would have been 80 centimeters, similar to Schwerer Gustav's, and for a mental image here, that is a tank with a barrel so big a grown man could have crawled inside it. Easily! A easily! 80 centimeters? It is terrifying to imagine the damage that this super tank would have inflicted. As well as the huge barrel, Monster was also designed to be equipped with multiple MG-151 autocannons, which, for reference, normally just go on combat aircraft. However, this absolute unit never left the drawing board. In 1943, the idea was scrapped by Albert Speer and subsequently deemed impractical. Had this machine been built, it would have surpassed the Panzer VIII as the heaviest tank ever made by nearly eight times the Panzer's weight. Overall, the super rail guns were quite impractical. While they looked terrifyingly impressive, they were in fact clunky and inefficient. The resources and time required to make these super machines operational just wasn't worth it, not to mention the sheer amount of men that were needed to assemble the tracks, operate the weapon, protect the weapon, and disassemble the weapon for long journeys. Had things gone differently, such as Krupp having Schwerer Gustav ready on time for the invasion of France, or perhaps if Langer Gustav was never bombed by the Royal Air Force, and maybe the war would have planned out really differently. Fortunately, it didn't. Perhaps the Maginot Line could have been broken, or perhaps London would have faced unparalleled barrages from the French coastline. The truth of the matter is, we'll just never know. These super rail guns, while they were used relatively effectively, they still fell remarkably short of their military potential. Now they are more of an intimidating sideshow for historians to look back on in awe. Whatever the case, Schwerer, Gustav, and Dora have cemented themselves in history as some of the most remarkable and awe-inspiring military machines ever made. Even if, to the Germans, they ended up being somewhat disappointing. So I really hope you found that video of Mega Projects interesting. If you've got more super weapons that you'd like us to look at, uh, let me know in the comments below and I will dig those up and uh, make a video about them. Just upvote the ones you like. It's how it works. And uh, if you like this video, smash that like button, subscribe, all of that great stuff, and I'll see you next time.